We have three speakers here today. Uh, we have Katrina Rylands from the Anti Capitalist Initiative, we have Terry Conway from Socialist Resistance, and we have Nick Rack from the Independent Socialist Network. Okay, so Kat, do you want to hear first? So the meeting is on socialist organisation and democracy. The obvious place to start is with the press and the SPP. I'm not going to go into details because I'm pretty sure everybody knows what happened. But um, what's important for us today is that a lot of organisational issues became implicated in this crisis. How did it happen that, um, that um, the leadership was able to sort of cover up and close ranks of the issue? So issues about democratic centralism, about minority rights, about factions, about slate elections, about um, how individuals come to become uh, indispensable in the organisation, about the lack of, um, <coughs> of critical culture. I think all of these have, have been brought up by the opposition within the SPP. I think that um, when we look at this, you know, this particular crisis that's happened here is unique to the SPP, but the problems that it exposes are not. I think that these problems um, are experienced all across the left. Nobody, nobody is immune to, to the sort of organisational problems that this has exposed. We should all look at it as um, sort of interested observers. It's something that we need to look at critically and um, self-reflective as well. Through, through a lot of these discussions within the SDP, uh, a lot's been talked about Lenin, about Lenin's model of the party, about the the way that the Bolsheviks are organised. So why does it matter for us? Because I know some people maybe don't find the topic so interesting, maybe don't think that um, we have stuff to learn from, from Lenin and the Bolsheviks, but why does, why does it matter to talk about them? Well, on the one hand, the left constantly refers back to their ideas about how they think the Bolsheviks are organised, their ideas about Lenin's party. So they refer sort of use that as a positive thing to, to organise themselves, to try and emulate. And then on the other hand, um, emerging new movements like, like Occupy, like the anti-globalisation movement, also refer back to it in a negative way. The way that they form their identity is constantly referencing it. It's, um, you know, it has ideas about how the Bolsheviks, you know, was, um, was organising and then how the, that And I think that, um, that for the movement, that actually that, that um, rejection of the Bolshevik model does have bad consequences because it sometimes results in anti-organisation culture, which um, which can have um, bad effects for the movement. So I think that um, it's important for us to discuss this, this experience of the Bolsheviks, to discuss um, what Lenin thought and to try and understand them so that we can critically approach both these points, both the way the left understands it and both the way the movement understands it. I would argue personally that both of these, um, both of these things, the, the understanding of the movement and the understanding of the left, are both in their own way based on the same kind of distortion of how the Bolsheviks organised and of Lenin's ideas. There's this myth of the Bolsheviks that they organised in a top-down manner and that they sought uh, an ideologically monolithic organisation. I think um, Lars Lee's book, I find it um, really great. It's, a, it's, it's obviously a historical topic, but it's, it's actually quite an easy book to read, and I would recommend that people read it. I think that it shows that, that that's not actually how they organised. That wasn't the ideal of a party. On the one hand, um, this myth is, is taking the Bolsheviks out of context. The Bolsheviks were organising under Tsarism were the average group, um, the average local group would last three months before it was arrested or sent into exile. And also the myth of this, this party is, um, is taking a lot about the Bolsheviks and retreat, the, the concept of democracy and retreat, the, the, you know, the ban on factions in 1921, etc. But actually if you look at the Bolsheviks, what they aspired to, despite the situation that they were in, was a mass organisation that organised even though they were organised under the Tsarism, they actually had a more democratic practice than a lot of the groups on the left today. They had minority rights, they were able to express differences openly, they had um, 
space in the papers, it had space to bring it up. It wasn't seen as as a negative thing to have the expression of differences. So I don't think that um, you know we should be seeking to replicate the Bolsheviks, but I think that we, there's a lot of great lessons that we can learn from the way that they organised. If some of their organisation was wrong, then it was wrong, and we won't replicate it. But there are good lessons that we can learn from it. I think that organisationally, we need to abandon this um, bureaucratic concept of democratic centralism, which forbids the expression of differences outside of the party. Um, internally, in some organisations, you're allowed to fight for your differences, but outside of the organisation, you have to present a, a sort of monolithic idea of the ideas of the party. And I think that this is underpinned by a negative perception of of political differences. So yeah, I think you know, I think you should have minority rights. I think that people should be able to um, express their views in inside the party and outside the party. Um, permanent factions, I think they have a lot of problems, but they should be a right to form a faction. Autonomy of, of local branches in their own affairs, these kind of things. But also, whilst there's a formal idea of what a democratic organisation is that we should aspire to. There's also the informal cultural aspect. You know, it's important to build a democratic culture as well as to build a, a formal democratic organisation. And I think that um, that that's really a part of overcoming the intolerance of, of difference and different different opinions. Yeah, I think that in, in a lot of organisations, there's this um, you know, obsession with with being right over. You know, it doesn't matter if it's useful. It doesn't matter if the strategy or the ideas are that you're pursuing has a use or is useful. The important thing is to be right, and I don't think that that is the, you know, I don't think that's the main aim of a of a socialist organisation. I think a lot of things become black and white and polarised. Labels are thrown around. Um, there's, you know, there's often like aggressive macho behaviour in socialist organisations, and there's there's a, an aim that like majorities in organisations that become possessed with the idea that they're right, often when different ideas come up, it's then necessary to smash those ideas instead of to, to try and engage with them and to see if there can be, you know, a, a synthesis to see what can be got from it. Yeah, because I think the, the reality of life is that people have different experiences and that's a lot of where we form our, form our understandings of events. It's you know our own experiences of engaging with people of our own lives and backgrounds. That's how we form understandings about the world, and that informs our ideas. That informs our ideas about strategy and tactics. And because of this, you can't it, you know it's it's mad to expect everybody then to share these same understandings of, of strategy and, and tactics. So I think yeah, it's really important to overcome this this intolerance. Of, of differing ideas. I think when you, you know, when new and young people come into an organisation um, that behaves in that manner, it encourages in them conformism and um, thoughtless, uncritical dogma, and that kind of behaviour is actually rewarded in the organisation. Um, and I think externally, you know, um, I've heard the argument that oh, if we express our differences externally, it's going to um, it's going to put people off, they'll think we're divided, they'll think we're you know, weak, but actually I think, for myself at least, it paints a negative picture. Um, it's, it's not attractive to look at an organisation and think, well, if I entered that organisation, I wouldn't be able to bring up my differences because they all agree with each other. The programme of a party, the, and the party, and the politics of the party, the, the way that I look at it is supposed to be like a, a distillation of, of the best you know, get the, the ideas of the organisation, the ideas of its members, it's supposed to be the best expression of that. And if we don't have an environment in which, you know, a formal and a cultural environment in which these these differences can be expressed and fought out and, and struggled for and clarified, then we'll never have that, um, we'll never have the, the best that it has to offer. Um, so yeah, while we have the, um, the crisis in the SQP, we also have the other crisis, the, the economic crisis, the, the crisis of capitalism, um, that presents itself to us um, 
especially with the austerity measures, is a desperate and immediate problem that demands we do something now. And I think a lot of the time that manifests itself in, okay, you know, we've got a massive problem that we're facing, it's immediate, it, we need something needs to be done about it now, so, you know, why are we having discussions like this today? We should be out there doing something, we should be out there, you know, engaging in action to, to stop the, these austerity measures. And I, I you know, I sympathise with, with that position, it's, you know, it's kind of a gut feeling, but I think that it's wrong to take that position because, on the one hand, action and politics are not separate things. Action, the actions that we take, you know, from the small things to, to the big things are underpinned by, by very political ideas and understandings about, um, you know, about the nature of capitalism today, about the, about the structure of the working class today or whatever. So, you know, actions that we take are deeply rooted in different political understandings. And I think that in that way, if you focus only on the action and not on the, on the discussion of what is beneath it, then that's actually manifests itself as an anti-democratic thing because democracy is, in its own way, for the organisation knowledge and these discussions and understanding need to be had by all. It can't just be had by a leadership presented as actions that we then take. So for me, really, now is, is precisely the time that we should be having discussions like the discussions that we're having today because we are in a serious situation it is desperate it is immediate so we actually do need to start thinking about how we're going to build something serious because because that is what we need we need a serious organization which can do something about this crisis and that does not exist now the left is is fractured into tiny sets and it's utterly marginalized from from the lives of people and it's not in a position to, to do something about austerity. So I think the, the question that that presents to the left is the question of unity. Now I don't think that unity should be like some complete principle. I don't think that it should be unity at any cost. But I think in, in, the, in the crisis that we're facing now to continue to pursue the idea that unity should be based on, on this agreement with um, what are often quite expansive programs. I think that that you know that's wrong. We're we're in a desperate situation. We do need to do something about it. But um, I think that in the anti-capitalist initiative, we do have disagreements on what kind of basis should this unity be. I think that a lot of people sort of are inspired by um, Syriza and that kind of unity. And we've talked about in the in the anti-capitalist initiative how there are two processes of unity. On the one hand the broader unity with um, forces that are to our right, forces that are reformist, and the unity on a, on a revolutionary basis. Now, personally, I think that the anti-capitalist initiative, it can't straddle these two sort of ideas about unity. We need to be directly pursuing one. And for me, that is unity on a revolutionary basis. Of course we should be involved in broader unity initiatives for sure, of course we should do common work with them, but it's a question of what we should be building and fighting for and, um, and what kind of organisation this crisis is calling out for. And again the crisis here is used to, to avoid politics, you know, the argument for let's leave um, divisive <coughs> revolutionary politics to the side and you know, unite to, to stop the cuts now. But actually, the way that I look at it, um, I think this crisis is calling out for politics, which is our politics, which is revolutionary politics. Capitalism is, a, is an, an economic crisis, but it's also in, in its own way in a, a crisis of ideology. People have lost faith in capitalism. Less and less people associate capitalism with progress, with human freedom, with democracy. <laughs> So I think that there is, in that way there is a vacuum, and that's not a vacuum that reformist politics can fill because it's still, it's still contained within, within the idea of capitalism. We need a politics which understands the system of capitalism and fights to overthrow it, and which shows and gives hope that the world can be organised on a fundamentally different basis. For me, that is the basis of unity that we should be struggling for, and that is the organisation that we should be trying to build. Um, that's what I think the SCI should be doing. Thank you. Thanks.